25 years of independence at fearless journalism hello and welcome thank you for joining us from wherever you are we are live from our studios here in Koko Mlemle on digital address GA0992539 our top stories this hour government vows that sanctions will be applied to persons who breach the lockdown rules even as concerns soar of more treatment of persons expected to be exempt we have highlights from a press conference held earlier this morning Seventy five major markets, over four thousand personnel. We tell you about the disinfection exercises in market as it reaches the Volta region today. We are live on the ground. And today on Frontline, we hear more of the experiences of persons who work within the health services. We hear their concerns and how COVID-19 has changed their lifestyles, even as health officials, call, uh, including persons here, my colleagues here at Joy News, share just how much health workers and those on the front lines mean to us. Those are top stories this hour. My name is Gifty Andopia. This is The Pulse. Please be my guest. Welcome. Let me take you through the details of those stories. Now, the Tachiman Division Police Command has arrested 18 persons for defying government's directive on mass gatherings. The arrests were conducted by the patrol team at the various drinking sports late into the night. All the 18 made of 12 males and 6 females are currently in custody and will be arranged before court. Anasa Bittas more in this report. In the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, a directive from the presidency has said that uh, there shouldn't be a gathering beyond 25 people here in Tichiman. A couple of uh, beer bars and restaurants have been operating, especially deep into the night, with a lot of people gathering within these settings. And that is a health hazard to the people around here and possibly could be as a result of the spread of this particular pandemic. As a result of this, the Tichman Divisional Police Command embarked on a patrol tonight to arrest people who have disobeyed. Divisional Police Commander Chief Superintendent Ohinibody Bosman has been speaking to join us. We taking the trouble to sensitize and educate the public very well on the directives of the His Excellency the President of the Republic of Ghana, Anadu Dankwe Kufado. For this reason, we've gone to all churches, all mocks, all social gathering places, uh, restaurants, bars, hotels. We've advised them drinking sports. We've advised them against gathering because it's a directive from the His Excellency the President. And also, it's a health hazard. So coronavirus is a very dangerous disease, which is killing the whole world and we need to fight it in the way we have to fight it to get out. So what we did was that we thought it was wise decision for us to educate and sensitize the people so that they understand the seriousness of the disease. But some of them were not listening. Yesterday, I personally went around with the police officers to all these restaurants, hotels, drinking sports to advise them to desist from gathering. They promised that they would do that. Today we went in the same place they were gathering again. So we decided to arrest them so that the law will take its course. I advise the general public so far as social gathering is concerned. I know some, some mosques, some churches, some funerals are still going on. What are, what are your advice for these people? This is not a, a, a good time for us for us to uh, go and have weekend rendezvous and all that. Everybody should abstain, spacing, washing your hands, make sure that there's no gathering. That is what we are doing. We are going to ensure that we do this to people obey the law. He tells me this should serve as a warning to the general public to desist from gathering, either on social basis, religious, or any form of gathering. So whoever finds himself in this bracket will be made to fail the full rigors of the law. Yeah, we are going to uh, prepare them for court so that 
if they have to break the locks of Ghana, then they have to face the law court. So we're going to court with them tomorrow. From the Division of Police Command here in Tichiman, I am Sabit for Joy News. Anas Sabit joins me on the line with an update on that story. Hello, Anas. Okay. Anas, what has happened to these 18 people who were arrested yesterday? Uh, they have been prepared to, uh, for the course uh, this afternoon. I was at the uh, command uh, an hour ago, and uh, last night uh, another uh, uh, patrol was uh, you know, undertaken and there are some um, 11 uh, uh, commercial sex workers were also picked, and uh, the place is uh, really uh, the first uh, people who were picked about 18 of them together with this. Uh, and also, I'm, I'm having a difficulty hearing you, um, uh, what you just said. Can you repeat that and do reposition? What I'm saying is that uh, this afternoon, all the 18 who were arrested um, uh, on Wednesday night will be arraigned before court this afternoon, together with some 11 others who are commercial sex workers who were picked late last night, uh, operating in their various brothers. So the police are arraigned. Uh, all these groups, uh, that is about uh, 29 of them uh, before the course this afternoon. I had a team and circuit court. That is uh, the latest from this development. Do, do, have, they, have you been able to speak to them? Do they have any explanation why they found themselves out at this time when there is a lockdown? No explanation. I mean, no convincing explanation from this team. In fact, there have been a series of uh, engagement between the police. And the operators of these uh, uh, beer bars or brothels or restaurants, uh, they came to a conclusion or agreement, an agreement that uh, these beer bars, of course, will be closed before 7 p.m. each night. So uh, there's been a series of agreements before them, even before this particular arrest were made. So mm. uh, a lot of them, they, they, they visited a number of uh, drinking floors of beer bars within the night. And a couple of them complied to the earlier directive with this team once uh, feeding to his, to the directive being given to them by the uh, police. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they've agreed or they have, they've admitted that uh, they've done the wrong thing and uh, they, they, they've been pleading to the authorities to let them go and they will not do that anymore. That is uh, from my engagement with them, this is what they have said uh, to me so far. Well, just to be clear, there is no lockdown in Bono East. What there is, though, is the general uh, directive against mass gathering. So that is what these people are being uh, picked up for. Yes, there is no lockdown here. But um, right. there's still some, uh, you know, a couple of uh, uh, people who have been disobeying the mass gathering. You know, uh, there's been a directive in relation to mass gathering. Some few Muslims still... Uh, praying the most. We have uh, recorded a number of them. Some also do embark on their usual funerals and uh, this, the issue of uh, having weddings, etc. Uh, this has nothing to do with the lock lockdown, but the usual directive or the earlier directive from the presidency that places a ban on social gathering or mass gathering. This is uh, the very reason why this has been picked for defying that particular directive. Okay, Anas, thank you for that update. Anas Sabit's there joining us from the Bono East region with an update. Uh, 18 people, that's the report, 18 people have been picked up for uh, defying government's ban on mass gathering. It's not about the lockdown in that area, it is about the mass gathering. Let's take a look at social distancing and how it is doing. I'm taking you to Amasia West, where residents, uh, Amasia West and South, where residents, uh, some residents are defying social distancing protocols. Traders, especially at Mansong Kwanta and Edubia, still gather in large numbers to transact business, ignoring threats of coronavirus. Public transportation or total vehicles load passengers to the full capacity despite the director to reduce those numbers. Nana Sensumensa has more in this report. Apart from staff at the assemblies who are observing strict social distancing and hand washing protocols, many people seem to live in their own world. District Chief Executive for Amancia South, William Bidia Kwansante, says it will take a while for people to adhere to the prevention protocols. Together with his colleague of Amancia West, Nila Teolenu, he says a joint public education campaign is ongoing. But in our setting, it will take some time. And we are carrying out very vigorous education. But with these items and others that are on, on, on its way coming, we are going to do more rigorous 
community education. And I'm sure people will begin to understand why they should do the social distancing and the other measures government has for now. So if for now you pass through town and you see that people are not observing it strictly, we are, we are, we are going to carry it to them. Now that we are getting some level of, of items, we are sending some to the markets and some other places. We will place some on the Veronica markets at some vintage points. And that will send a signal to the, the, the community that uh, everybody must wash their hands, must use the sanitizers. Meanwhile, the two assemblies have sought assistance from mining firm Asanko Mines for sanitation and education materials. The company has presented Veronica buckets, hand sanitizers, medicated soaps, and protective gear worth 20,000 cities to each of them. Executive General Manager Chas Amoa says some company medical staff will be deployed to assist the assemblies in the COVID-19 fight. As a company, since one of our pillars in delivering CSR also revolves around health, we found it good as a company to come and assist uh, the district in fighting this uh, uh, virus. We have come to the knowledge that there are various educational programs that is going on, like washing of hands and what have you. Uh, we as a company have decided today to deliver various items which will help with this education and uh, fighting this pandemic that has come. Uh, as a company, we have various uh, protocols that we currently use to guide us in also fighting this uh, pandemic. Uh, one of which is collaborating with the health facilities in the district by way of education and assisting. And in addition to what we have uh, delivered, we've also had a small amount of money which will help the district in also propagating its educational programs to the various institutions under it. Nana, Asensu Mensa, reporting for... Nana Sensu Mensa filed that report. Well, not only food prices and other commodities have gone up in the wake of COVID-19, equipment and other consumables used within the health sector have. The availability of gun thermometer on the market and its prices are hurdles that some COVID-19 teams in some districts are faced with. The District Director of Health, Isaac Anobel, in the OT region, made this known during the commissioning of the Jazikan District COVID-19 Health Committee of that region. Of the 21 health centers in the district hospital there, only six facilities have gun thermometers to check temperatures of clients who visit those health centers. A report by Peter Seno, our correspondent for the OT region. The Jessican District Health Director, Isaac Anobil, says the cost of medical supplies, especially the gun thermometer, has gone up significantly from 200 Ghana cities to 1,200 Ghana cities. This situation, according to the director, is not helping the fight against the possible spread of the infectious virus into the district since the health facility is running on limited internally generated fund. He also revealed that of the 21 health facilities in the district, only six have gun thermometers for screening. Most of our facilities don't even have the gun thermometers we are using to take the, the temperature. So what they do is that they take a verbal history of the person to find out. Uh, the problem is actually not getting them from the suppliers. And even as we get them, the price is too much uh, exaggerated. And that has really been a challenge. Uh, the gun thermometer we used to buy at 200 cities is now costing 1,200. That is actually posing a challenge. If not that, we would have been able to get one from one of these uh, stakeholders. But we are still working on it. We are hoping to get enough gun thermometers for our various community uh, health nurses and the staff at our peripheral facilities to ensure that this exercise uh, is, is, is done appropriately. Meanwhile, the COVID-19 team in the district is collaborating with traditional authorities to fish out lockdown returnees for screening. Asafwache Amankwa Boateng speaks for the Jasikan Traditional Council. He says people who have traveled into the district in recent past weeks are voluntarily reporting for testing. We have informed all the chiefs that those things should be done in the community. At least they should be able to list the names of those who have come 
identify them properly so that they will be submit to the health director so that they can be monitored and see whether any of them is carrying the virus. Most of the people are voluntarily coming out that they have traveled uh, from uh, Accra to the community and that is even helping us because they themselves have agreed to come out that they are from that place. In Jessica alone we are able to get about 15 people who have arrived. Uh -huh. However, according to the health directorate, this has not been easy as people tried to hide retainees. The exercise has produced two suspected cases, each under self and mandatory quarantine, pending the outcome of test results from Accra. It hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy. Um, when you go to the house, even after you have identified the house and you go to the house, the family members kind of hide their, their, their relatives. And uh, as much as possible, the, uh, the communication team is on the ground. We are doing a lot of uh, education using the public CIC centers and the radio stations to, to educate the people. One of the cases reported to the hospital and um, based on the signs um, and meeting our case definition on the screening too, is a suspect and uh, we have taken a sample and submitted um, this morning. And uh, there's another case of a traveler, no symptoms, no signs, no sick, but because of the president's directive on um, getting all travelers who came from around 3rd March to date uh, screened. Uh, we have taken his sample and submitted, but we are still waiting for the results. Peter Senu for Joy News. The Ghana Prison Service says it is implementing the social distancing directive as a measure to curb coronavirus despite the large number of inmates in the prisons nationwide. It says although the lack of equipment and hand sanitizers is hampering their efforts, measures are in place to screen officers before entry into the prison yards. Acting Director of Health Patients, Bafo Boni, spoke to Joy News. It's just, um on behalf of the Director General of Prisons, I want to say a very big thank you to the Church of Pentecost for their donation because everything they have brought is something we need as a matter of agency. And as you are all aware, in the prison, you are physically confined. And with this pandemic, I think that it should be everybody's interest that you come on board for us to fight it. Inmates may be inside, but officers will continue to go to from work to their houses and back on a daily basis, which redefines the prison officer also as a frontliner. How are you maintaining social distancing in the prison? The education has gone on, so it, we are only able to maintain it to a point in the prison's facilities. And that is the more reason why we need more of these items. So at least if we are able to get them protect themselves with no, no mask, washing of hands, and all that, at least to a large extent, we will be able to bring the situation under control. So we'll uh, not much, not if we have enough, we should be able to give everybody. And as you are all aware, it is only such donations which will help. But the quantum, we are looking at about 16,000 prisoners nationwide. So you can imagine how many of disposable nose mask we need at a time and all the other relevant things like can sanitizers and then more of um, loose protection and stuff like that so and Deputy, Health, uh, Deputy Minister of Health Alexander Aban is also cautioning the Ghana Ambulance Service against fuel theft. He says individuals caught would be dismissed. Mr. Aban announced this when he received a fuel coupon worth over 200,000 CDs donated by Puma Energy Ghana Limited. Puma Ghana's donation means 78 ambulances of the Ghana Ambulance Service can draw fuel from the depots of the company as the country fights coronavirus. Group Managing Director Henry Osei says this will lessen the financial burden on government in order to flatten the coronavirus curve in Ghana. You know, as a company that is driven to serve the community, we feel the need that to support government in its efforts in fighting this pandemic. The pandemic, from the fight against the pandemic, from our point of view, is a shared responsibility. So we were motivated by that to support the efforts of government because we realize that one person alone cannot foot the entire bill in fighting the pandemic. And that's why we wanted as, an, as a company to offer our support in terms of fuel 
for the National Ambulance Service in commuting to undertake emergency operations in this fight. So this, this course was mainly to make sure that we get the Ghana Health Service and the Ghana Ambulance Service energized. So tomorrow, if you see an ambulance undertaking an emergency operation in this fight, remember that behind that ambulance is energy provided by Prima Energy to support the cause of the of fighting the pandemic. So that Deputy Minister of Health Alexander Aban says any staff of the ambulance service caught siphoning fuel will be dealt with. One other thing that we should guard against, especially for those in the ambulance service, is that because we know some company has made donation of fuel, uh, you go, you can pack the ambulance somewhere and you draw the fuel out of it. For me, I'm just letting you know, pass it on to them. Anybody who does that, I think, will sack the person. Yes, because uh, we see it and we hear of it many times, especially uh, those who have been uh, driving uh, cars belonging to corporate bodies or to government. It doesn't belong to them. So sometimes they find ways of drawing the fuel and then they will come and tell you that, oh, it's finished. I don't think we are going to do that. They should also help in this fight. Evans Aziamo Mensah's report for Join News. And the chief executive officer of the Ghana Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors, Senor Hossi, has donated uh, boomsticks to the multimedia group to aid in the execution of our work. In this time of COVID-19 pandemic, presenting the items, he commended the multimedia's contribution to disseminating information to the general public on coronavirus. On behalf of the Ghana Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors, we want to present these uh, boom uh, mic poles um, to you, uh, the multimedia group. Um, one, we absolutely recognize the value of the work you are delivering, and these times are key times for us as a country. While we stay at home, you have to take the risk of, trying, of, of contracting this virus just to be able to serve us, share information with us, to keep us up to date with things. In fact, as I said, you guys are the ones keeping the country safe, sane as at now, but you are doing it at the risk of your lives. So these posts are supposed to help you exercise the social distance uh, protocols that are required to protect you. So with this, you should be able to now have your interviews with some two meters or three meters apart. So we wish you all the best. As a country, I believe everybody owes the media a lot of gratitude at the, by the end of this fight because you are the front line and you are exercising a high-risk job and we really appreciate what you do. God bless you. On behalf of the, bank, uh, of the Chamber of uh, Bulk Oil Distributors, thank you. That was Senor Jose, CEO of Ghana Chamber of Bulk Oil Distributors. The items were received on behalf of the multimedia group by head of our health desk, Fred Smith. He expressed our gratitude and acknowledged Mr. Jose's contribution to the fight against COVID-19. Um, so we'd like to say a big thank you for thinking about us this way. Uh, a lot of the times, because of the way we do our job, we forget that we ourselves are also at risk and we end up chasing the information ahead of our own oh, safety nice. and uh, for you to have thought about us this way uh, we deeply appreciate we followed you uh, personally and we know the contribution you are making towards the fight against uh, the coronavirus and also the chamber you've been very supportive to not just the media but the entire Ghanaian society so we'll say a big thank you uh, we urge you to continue doing this and um, uh, you also be blessed. Amen. Stay blessed. Yeah. There is putting the media in the front line. Certainly we are at the front lines in these. I'll take a break when I return. We'll do the front line. Welcome back to the show. Many thanks for staying with us. We'll be doing Frontline shortly, but let's go to Germany first. Thomas Sparrow is political correspondent with our partners, DW. He's joining us, connecting all the way from Germany to give us an update uh, of the, the European update. There. Hello, Thomas. Hello, Gifty. Nice to talk to you. This time, not from home, as we've been doing in the last few days, but from our political studios 
here in central Berlin to give you the update of how the coronavirus situation is here in uh, Europe. The situation still remains very difficult across the continent and one of the big questions that has been asked in recent days is how big European solidarity will be in times of crisis, how European countries will be able to manage to get together and tackle this crisis because this is a crisis that has affected in different ways, but it has affected all countries in the European Union. Well, talking about the European Union and how it is dealing with this, how has the, how has the, the Union itself supported uh, particularly Italy uh, and Spain, Italy which has become an epicenter, how have they been able to support these countries that have been under immense pressure because we learned that China has had to send in some help? There are different ways of, of looking at this. There are bilateral ways in which, for example, Germany has been able to help Italy. For example, patients from Italy have been flown to Germany. Germany has more capacity to deal with some of the patients that are being flown in. There are more beds, for example, here. That's one element that shows you how solidarity might be working on a bilateral level that happens between other countries as well. But there's a wider Pro, the, the wider problem or the wider issue of European solidarity. There are different ways that European leaders have been discussing how they could help the countries that are most affected, whether it is using an already established mechanism, whether it is using something called the corona bonds, which uh, some countries, including Germany, are against. There are other aspects as well that have been discussed on how the European Union can actually carry out this idea of European solidarity. For now, Gifty, it's fair to say that the coronavirus could provide Europe with a very big opportunity to precisely try and show how this union of countries work. But at the same time, it is revealing its weaknesses and it is showing how difficult it can be to carry out this solidarity when you have such a big crisis and so many countries affected. Let's bring it home to Germany. We know that uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel has tested negative. Is there any update uh, from, from that side of town before we move on to general Germany? She has tested negative, that's correct. And today she managed to leave her isolation. She had been in isolation for around two weeks. It was a preventive isolation after she had had contact with a doctor who tested positive. Angela Merkel had then three tests and all three tests came out negative, so she announced today that she would again leave uh, that isolation and work from the chancellery. In uh, the two weeks where she was in isolation, she still continued to rule and to govern here in, in Germany, but she did that mostly in a remote way, so taking part, for example, remotely on conferences or cabinet meetings. Uh, now she will be able to go again uh, to the chancellery, and as such, this comes at an important time here in Germany Looks like we've lost uh, we've lost uh, Thomas there, but Thomas Sparrow is political correspondent with our partners TW. He joined us all the way from Berlin with update. He was just telling us about the European Union and the decisions that have been taken there to support countries within the U European Union that have been affected. Um, by coronavirus he was giving us an update on angela merkel who uh had to be quarantined after he, he she came into contact with her doctor who tested um positive after he uh, she gave her some vaccinations um she was also he was also telling us um that that is the situation right now we will g try and get back to thomas if possible but we're also trying to give you the world outlook uh of coronavirus. Thomas is back on with me. Hello Thomas, we lost you briefly. Sorry that we, lo that we lost each other. I was actually telling you about Angela Merkel testing uh, negative and how she's now back in action working from the Chancellery and that comes as at an important time for Germany because although there are some signs of hope that the measures are actually working here in the country, they're still very much in place. They will be in place until at least the 19th of April. Well, Thomas, let's come to Germany before we call it a wrap. Now, I'm seeing very interestingly, these are certainly what I'm seeing in the background is certainly what uh, Germany looks like right now. But this is a very, happens to be a very busy tourist attraction, a very busy place right now. What is the general mood in, in Germany? I've been walking around a bit now that I'm in central Berlin, around some of the most important sites here in the city, and they're practically empty. 
And this is not something, something unusual for, for Germany. In fact, it is something that's happening also in many other parts around the world. The biggest tourist sites, the sites that are normally full of people from around the world, now empty because of all the restrictions put in place. And by the way, these are restrictions that are affecting many countries and their bilateral relations as well. Germany has put in practice a big plan, a very big plan, not the only country to do so, but it is a big plan here in Germany to try and bring back some of the tourists that have been stranded in other parts of the world. And uh, Germany has now been able to bring back nearly 200,000 of its citizens from basically more than 40 countries, around 50 countries. And this is something that has been very important in the last few days that the European Union will also be working on. But that just gives you an idea of why not only European cities like Berlin just behind me or other cities around the world are simply empty now because tourism in particular is something that has been badly affected because authorities have been telling people to stay at home because that is the biggest way in which we can actually fight and combat coronavirus at these times. It's good to see that you've been able to leave your home today and head towards the office. Thomas, thank you. Thomas Powers, political correspondent with our partners DW. Let's take a look at the world outlook. What is it saying and what is happening in the countries, especially those hardly hit? We start from a hard hit country. We start from the United States, which is certainly topping the league as presented by Johns Hopkins University. Um, in the US, we're looking at one million, uh, well, one million forty one thousand one hundred and twenty six total confirmed that's the total confirmed cases that's the total confirmed cases uh, across the world let me give you the united states breakdown it starts it has a, a 245,658 confirmed cases so far 6,069 people have died in the united states of america the 9,311 people have also recovered the next country that comes right after the united states of america is spain and in spain we recorded, we recorded 117,710 cases. That's what's happening in Spain. 10,000 people have died. That 10,935 people have died. Those who have recovered, about 30,513. In Italy, which was hardly, uh, very, really hit uh, by this, as you heard Thomas there explaining They've recorded 115,242 cases. This is a case that started with just about four. So they were looking at 13,915 13, uh, 13, people who have died. 18,278 have recovered. We've already had the Germany uh, situation. Let's take a look at China. I um, mean, China, one, uh, one million in China. China has recorded 55,132 deaths. The total recovered 221,262. Let's make a quick stop to Africa, take a look at what's happening in Africa um, as well. Well, you do know already what our figures say here in Ghana. Let's take a look at Burkina Faso. In Burkina Faso, they're looking at 288. The last time we checked, we're around 190 following uh, just after us. Right now, they have recorded 288. 16 people have died so far in Burkina Faso. 50 people have recovered. What's happening in Senegal? Senegal will have 207 totally confirmed cases. Only one person has died, which is a good thing. 66 people, by the way, have recovered in Senegal. It's will be interesting to know what is it that Senegal is doing. And of course, Ghana's state has also been updated by Johns Hopkins University. 204, five people have died. We're told that 31 people have been recover have recovered, but we also know the breakdown is that some of them have been uh, taken home where they will be managed. Cote d'Ivoire, we do Cote d'Ivoire in Nigeria, and then we call it a wrapping. Cote d'Ivoire, 194, not uh, running as quickly as we have. 194, the last time we checked, they were around 190. Cote d'Ivoire has 194. One person has died. 15 of those 194 have recovered. In Nigeria, um, which managed to contain its case, uh, at least for the reported cases, 190 totally confirmed 
uh, total confirmed cases 190, total deaths 2, and the total recovered 20. You can take your time and go on the John Hop Johns Hopkins uh, website and um, take a look at the details of those countries and what they have recorded so far. This is The Pulse with me, Gifty, and Dorpia. Let's do Frontline. On Frontline today, I bring you more of the experiences of our frontline health workers. I'll take you to the Kolobu Teaching Hospital. We'll be talking to an infectious disease uh, specialist there as well. You also hear from officials that are supporting all of you in the front line and edging you on, making you know that we're here for you. You hear from my own colleagues here at Joy News who say we are with you. Before I get on to go to, to, to take you to the Kolobu Teaching Hospital where we'll be talking to Sheikh Ibrahim Ibn Sana, I'd love, for, I'd love for you to take a look at this video we've pieced together. It's not easy. We are coping. Sometimes when you go home, they, you, you can't even get near your relatives. They said, hey, are you bringing some of the condition? So we start removing our shoe outside, putting our things outside. Just enter into the bathroom before you even come close to them. My name is Lexus Bill. We actually are grateful eternally to all our frontline staff, our doctors, nurses, our policemen, our officials as well, our military men who are ensuring that we're staying at home. All of you are our heroes. God bless you and thank you so much for all that you're doing for Ghana. God bless you. Over the years, I've had a fair appreciation of what not only medical doctors, but all health professionals go through during this period that COVID-19 is threatening our very existence as a people, we would like to say a very, very big word of encouragement to all health professionals who have put themselves in the front line. Keep up the good work, and we pray that together, as we all support you, all of this will come to an end. My name is Nathaniel Atop, and I'd like to say thumbs up to every single health professional at the front line of all of this to everyone out there who is a health worker, our nurses, our doctors, physician assistants, all the frontliners who are giving out their all in order to help the sick and to the frontliners, especially those handling our patients who, are, who have been affected with the coronavirus. I say may God bless them. May God give them the energy, the strength in these trying times to be able to help all patients. May God bless them. Aiko Ghana Damase. Thank you from Mrs. Morgan. And Mrs. Morgan ends it there for us. Thank you, Mrs. Morgan. Wherever you are, we want you to also send your videos. If you have a song, you have a poem, you can post for those people who are putting their lives at risk. Just so we'll bring you information and also to uh, give you health advice. You want to send them through to our WhatsApp platform. We'll put the number there. There it is for you. That's 0540109009. Let's hear from you. We'll also open the phone lines now. I will, I'm sure that you've seen this video that's been going around. It was put together by GI. IPC. In that video, they assemble doctors and health professionals, essentially, that are urging you to stay at home. Well, I'll be talking to, to them here on Frontline as we go along. I have one of them who's on standby for us. He's joining me via Skype. Sheikh Ibrahim Ibn Sana is a public health and infectious disease pharmacist. He's also head of pharmacy unit at Chest Diseases at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital. Doc, it's good to have you. Thank you so much. Sheikh. Thank you for having me. I'm very grateful. Right. I'm going to, we're, we're going to open the phone lines and ask people to talk to you or share with you the encouraging messages for you. But I want to start by asking you, how has COVID-19 changed the way you know life to be? Thank you very much for this. First, let me take the opportunity to 
treating the uh, Imahu head of the book, the constructive slices in his income. He brought up this idea that uh, about it when he had immobilized and educate the public, and uh, the life has never been the same. COVID-19 has revolutionized the thing that the health workers now in our country, we are, this is our situation. Our lives are sick. We are the last men standing. And so that we keep the past from this pandemic. We are doing all we can. And we hope we will defeat it. Support courage as well as assistance from the public. And I must say that we are overwhelmed. I support the press and encourage. As we encourage our last best that the pandemic is defeated in this. Uh, uh, Sheikh, I'll have to just uh, pause you on briefly there. We're having a little issue with the, uh, with the smoothness of the line. But I want to really hear what you're saying, and I want my viewers to also be able to hear what you're saying. Uh, let's try and raise you up on a phone line, and then we can hopefully hear you better. But as we work on that, take a listen to the Deputy Health Minister today on just how much those at the front line mean to us. Fellow Ghanaians, my name is Alexander Kujokom Adam. I'm the MP for Goma West and the Deputy Minister for Health. Stay home means stay home. Please do that for Mother Ghana, do that for yourself. And as you do that, you actually facilitate the work of the frontliners as they go to look for those who may have been in contact with those who traveled. And of course, as they look for those who traveled, it is in our collective interest. So please stay home and let the frontliners do their work for yourself, for me, and for Mother Ghana. Thank you. Well, you had the Deputy uh, Health Minister there. I'm going to take you back to the Health Ministry and we'll hear from the technocrats as well. Fellow Ghanaians, my name is Dr. Mrs. Martha Jansalutrot. I'm Director of Technical Coordination at the Ministry of Health. Stay home means stay home. But must you go to the hospital? We want to plead with you. Be transparent about your travel history. Tell the health worker where you have been so that we will be able to provide you the care you needed. If you hide your travel history from us, you are endangering the health worker. The health workers must be there to help. Help us help you. Stay home. Thank you. Let's hear from the CEO of the Ghana Ambulance Service. I'm Professor Ahmed Nuhu Zakaria. I'm the CEO of the Ghana Ambulance Service. Obviously, as you are all aware, the paramedics are part of the frontliners in the combat um, of this COVID-19. And the role of the emergency services, especially the pre-hospital emergency care system, is the fact that for every country to succeed, you will definitely need a system where the translocation of patients is very effective. So on that note, we really want to encourage everybody to stay at home and stay safe. The earlier we bring this um, uh, pandemic to a halt, the better for all of us. And so the best way to assist the emergency services is just to stay at home and stay safe. Now, when you stay at home, what you do is that you're preventing the spread of coronavirus and it reduces the pressure that is brought to bear on the people who work at the front lines. So I'm going to take you back to Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Some of you are still sending in your messages. I'm grateful for that, saying thank you to them. I still have Sheikh Ibrahim Ibn Sana. If you have questions uh, about uh, coronavirus, if you have uh, any encouraging words for people like him who are at the front lines dealing with you on a daily basis, you can, set, you can uh, call these numbers on your screen 
and I'll push them through to uh, Sheikh Ibn Sana. Sheikh, it's good to have you once again. You were telling me about how COVID-19 has changed the way that life has been for people like you who are at the front line. Exactly, my dear. Um, you know, prior to COVID-19, I am in the, you know, I'm in the, the Department of Infectious Diseases. Yeah. We deal with tuberculosis, which is close to COVID-19. Just that the incubation period of COVID-19 is 2 to 14 days, while that of TB is 3 to, three to 1 year. And then also the element of the difference is the fibrosis. Fibrosis occurs faster. Fibrosis is the, your lung turning into fibrous nature, becoming hard. The lung losing its elasticity. So we are very much particular with this. But wearing of masks has not been a factor, has not been mandatory for many people, even when they come to the department, health workers inclusive. But when COVID-19 came in, Everybody's life has been changed. Everybody is very much particular about wearing face masks, N95, taking precautions with regard to sanitizing our environment, our hands, you know, using hand sanitizer, using aprons. So life has never been the same for any health worker, especially for those of us at the forefront. COVID-19 tells you that your life is at stake. When you contract the disease, you may go. So you do everything possible to ensure that your life is protected. But then, because you have sworn an oath to protect the general public, your life is secondary, even though you take precautions, but your main duty is to save the patient, to save the public who are coming in day by day. Some are coming into church, some are suspected cases, and we are dealing with them adequately. The chief executive of Kolebuti Team Hospital, Dr. Sari, and his lieutenant management, we are on daily basis checking on the world, checking on the patient, and they are ensuring that all that we need are supplied, even though we have a number of challenges. We think that we are also up to the task to ensure that we together we can combat this pandemic. Okay. We so hope the public support. So, Sheikh, sorry to interrupt you there. I have a couple of people who have called on the line right now. I'll let them just push their questions or whatever it is they have to say to you right on. I have Gordon Anyomi, who is calling from Hohoi. Hopefully, I haven't lost Gordon. Hello, Gordon. Okay, looks like we've lost him. Let me take you to Tamale. Amadu uh, is joining us from Tamale. Hello, Amadu. Hello, good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon. Sorry for keeping you waiting. Amadu, we do have yeah. Um, yeah. Sheikh uh, Ibrahim yeah, Ibn Sana. To, yeah, to talk to I him. want to ask Sheikh. Uh, there are people in Tamale uh, teaching hospitals where the suspected case was tested and became a positive. Hmm. And they tested them. I know the incubation period of this virus is 14 days. After testing them the first time, and they are negative. They allow them and they are roaming with us in summer. But did you say they are negative? Some sort of them to quarantine them for 14 days to retest them to see either they are negative or positive. Within that short time, when they test them and they are negative, it has just become a good news for them that they are negative. So they okay. allow them to remove. Okay, so you want to find out from Doc whether those people should be moving around or should be should yeah, having quarantine? Yeah, they should quarantine. have quarantined them for 14 right. days. Who knows, the, before the government locked down okay. the airport, look at the people that they quarantined, look at the little on the, uh, the virus, how they are getting kids. All right. Thank you very much for calling Thank from you. Tamale. I have one more question, a uh, caller from Kanishi. Robert is on the line. Robert, what's your question or what's your yeah. encouraging words for our frontline good workers? After, good afternoon, GP. Good afternoon. In fact, continue your, with your smile. It, it always keeps me away. <laughs> and I like it. And in fact, I want to encourage the frontline. In fact, they are doing very good work. Uh, you, you, for instance, yesterday at your station, you show at Wager where they, are, they were moving. There was no PPE for them. They were complaining. But yet still, you realize that they were trying as much as possible to go and do their work. Yeah. And myself and my, my wife, every day, we pray for them. And we hope that God will continue to protect them so that in receiving the patients, they will not receive virus as well. But God bless them, and they should continue the good work. Amen.
final question and then we'll have a, a, a Sheikh answer or speak to them and then we'll do the next round of three. Albert is calling from Saboba. Albert, how are you? I'm fine, madam. Albert, talk to us. All right. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody for the way and manner we are approaching the pandemic. Uh, I really appreciate what the health workers are doing and the government as a whole. But my concern is uh, much attention has not been given to especially our, our health sector. So I don't know. Uh, you realize that especially nurses uh, of this country, until such things like this happen, mm -hmm. and we now turn our attention to our health system. You have nurses who have completed since 2017 and have not been posted. And our health system have inadequate, uh, you know, nurses in the in the in the facilities. Okay. So things so. like this has really prompted uh, us to the need of our health system and where we should place our priority on. Okay. All right. I want thank to thank you. you so much. Thank you very much for calling. So let's yeah. let me come to you, um, Sheikh, for some answers if you can help us with them. He's saying that in Tamale, at the Tamale Teaching Hospital, some people were. Uh, tested, they it proved negative, but he thinks that those people should have been quarantined. But as far as he's concerned, they are walking around. Is anything wrong with that? I think that in the first place, the incubation period of the virus is two to fourteen days. <coughs> like I was just supposing with vaccination, which is uh, three weeks to one year. The, when it happens like that, within the first two to fourteen days, anything could happen. You could test negative in the first time, but within the next three days, you could, you know, be positive. So I would, what we want the government to be doing or facilities to be doing is that those people must be closely monitored. They can do self-isolation in their homes at least for the next three days to retest again to find out if they are indeed negative. Because once an individual is a suspected case, then everybody is watching as what would happen. So in order to remove the stigma around the person, a reconfirmatory check the next three days or four days can free everybody's mind that this person is indeed negative. Because suspected cases come in when we are sure that this particular person must have come in contact with a positive case. We want to bring break the transmitting uh, chain of the disease. And that is why you know, following them and then ensuring that they are retested within a short time is key. We are aware of the challenges government is facing, but we are sure that if we do this, we'll be able to arrest it on time. Okay. I must also say that there are challenges in the system. For example, in Kolebu here, we don't have enough PPE. We need a public support us. We need N95. We need ordinary face masks. We need aprons, we need sanitizers, we need Veronica buckets. Anything that could support in the fight against COVID-19, mm. we need them. The public okay. can come in and donate to us, individuals, NGOs. They can come in and support because this fight, we are in the forefront. But we need all the citizenry of Ghana to be behind us to ensure that we can combat this pandemic effectively. Appeal there for donations. Of course, the entire world has been asking for donations. So I will share with you a. Uh, I will share with you, my viewers, a, um, a, a a screenshot of something that's going round. I think some doctors could bring in themselves together to ask for some uh, donation. I'll show you how you can help those doctors. But um, uh, uh, Sheikh, there was another person who was asking about the number of nurses who have not been posted and the fact that. This is a time where we may need those people. What's your perspective on that? I think that at this particular juncture, any person that is trained, that has had the minimum of training in health, is needed. We need all hands on deck. And so in the coming days, the Minister of Health and the government itself, government machinery will think about something like that, so that people who are staying at home can't even be employed temporarily. You can use the municipal authorities or the district assembly to get the people to work. Since you are already trained by our resources, the state resources, 
This is the time we need them. We can rub them in for this period and then ensure that they are remunerated, motivated very well to help fight the disease. Because one of the key things that is lacking is the human resource capacity in terms of health. Human resource infrastructure, we still have some, there are still some gaps. But the human resource personnel, we have a lot of challenges. I know it is because of resources, uh, budgetary constraints that we have as a government and as a nation. But in times like this, let's try and reach out to those people because these are not ordinary times. We need everyone who has the knowledge of how to care for patients, how to support, how to even transport victims from one place to the other, how to even educate people, how to convey information. All those people are needed. I think we don't have enough people. We think that anybody that wants to be a volunteer, the government must give a listening ear to it and then ensure that the person comes on board to come and support. So okay. I, I, I say in the view that people who are not been taken on board, health personnel who have been trained but have not been taken on board, government should find a way of, you know, ameliorating their situation so that we, we can augment the staff that we have. Okay, let me take this final call and then I'll do a quick, uh, another interview, bring someone else in into this discussion. Um, Emil is calling us from Kumase. Emil? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Emil. Talk to us. All right. Um, let me begin by first and foremost commending you for this wonderful initiative of introducing the front line where we can celebrate our heroes and heroines who have dedicated their lives, even at the peril of their lives, to save lives. And what I want to tell Sheikh is that we are very much grateful to them. We pray that God will continue to sustain them, God will continue to lift them up, God will continue to insulate them. They will be delivered from any form of infestation. Amen. They will be strong. We, we are very proud of them. Right. We dove out our heart out to them. And I personally want to begin this. I am a pledge at all times to stay at home and only go out when the need be. Thank, Emil, you very thank much. you so much. God bless you. I'm sure that our doctors and our frontline workers who are listening or watching are very touched by your words. Encourage others around you to stay at home as well. I read just this message and then I'll introduce someone else who joins us on the line. Frontliners, he says, are like a field of flowers who has covered our life with a flower of their true self. Frontliners fill our life with beautiful and inerasable memories that has become uh, that have become unfor unforgettable mental files encrypted in the chamber of our soul called the world. Stay, stay, frontliners. Stay safe, Team Mobek members. From a Tuahine Kenneth at the University of Energy um, in uh, Sunai. Now, it's been five days since the lockdown in Greater Accra, uh, Greater Kumase, Kaswa, and some parts of Tema. Stories about persons attempting to flee the restrictions have been the order of the day. But what really is the regional impact of the lockdown, especially areas which are not affected uh, by the lockdowns? So we'll be speaking to a member of the of NDC's COVID-19 team about this following their statement yesterday, offering some recommendations to government on the management of the virus. Dr. Vaida Nyagre Yakbong is a senior lecturer at UDS Tamale. She's currently the vice dean of the School of Allied Health Sciences and was also the head of department of midwifery. I'll talk to her. Uh, well, we'll we take a message for the front line and after we're done with front line, we'll go back to her and have that conversation. Hello, Doc. Hello. Dr. Yagbon, thank you very much for your time. I'm going to talk to you in detail, but before that, I'd like for you, well, in this segment, we're looking at front line. We're talking about those are the front lines, and we would we like to appreciate them and address every issue that concerns them. So I'll take your message for these people on the front line, and then we'll wrap up with front line, then we'll have our conversation separately. Okay. So we're listening to you. What message do you have for those at the front line? Yeah, first of all, I really want to appreciate them. Uh, globally, it has been an issue when it comes to the frontline health workers. And if we look at statistics out there from China, Italy, uh, Spain, and all of that, the majority of those who have been affected, when you look at their confirmed cases, are also frontline health workers. Right. So it means that these are people who are vulnerable, if you look at it that way. Mm. And we should pay attention to their needs. We could mobilize all the money, the infrastructure, and what have you. 
But if we are not able to have our front line health workers stay at home, if they lay down their tools, then all that we are mobilizing will be useless. Who will be there to take care of them? Mm. And so for them to lay their life and then to want to save life in this nation, I think that we should do our best as a government to respond to their needs as soon as possible. I think it has even uh, been over delayed. Right. So I want to continue to urge them uh, to be committed, but also have a voice. And when conditions are not good, they need to speak about it. And then the uh, government must listen to their voice. Okay, so that is the message for frontline workers. Let me come to you again, uh, uh, Sheikh Ibrahim. Sheikh, are you there? Yes, I'm already Right, so let's wrap up our conversation. I'm not sure that we'll be able to take any more phone calls. So let's wrap up our conversation before I go on to talk about the lockdown uh, with Dr. Uh, Yagbon, who is, by the way, appreciating all the work that you've been doing. Uh, I, I, I'd like for you to give us your final words, if, if, if any, at this point. Thank you so much. My final word that I want to give is that people should take this opportunity to assess themselves in terms of how you know well they take care of their health and then the precautions that they take in their offices and their workplaces. I would also like to take the opportunity to sensitize the general public about tuberculosis because tuberculosis, especially those who have MDR tuberculosis, there are some similarities, very, very close similarities okay between COVID-19 and tuberculosis. Mm. And we know that tuberculosis and it is in our general public. So please, when you have a productive cough, plus all the other signs, the weakness, the fever, the sneezing, then you are thinking of tuberculosis. But when the cough is dry and non-productive, then you are thinking of COVID-19. Okay. COVID-19, we are still we'll be able to defeat it. But we want the general public to henceforth take care of this. We are also, like I said earlier, appealing to the general public. You know, we are all at home now. Mm -hmm. We are advising everybody to be at home. But a lot of things may happen in your home. So take very good care. I'm sure my boss, you know, team leader, Dr. Ampoma from uh, National Reconstruction of Plastic Burn Center in Kolebu, will shed light next time on uh, home injuries and the rest. But we are very grateful to all of you. We are very grateful to Ghana and the EG, the government, and the general workforce of the uh, Ghana, you know, Ghana's health workers. And mm -hmm. those of you who are there praying for us, we are so, so grateful. We know you continue to support us and pray for us. Thank you so much for all the support after now. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today. I'm sure that as we go along, we'll be talking to most of your colleagues and the issues and the concerns that exist will raise them and try and get the attention of the authorities so they can fix these problems. In the meantime, like I said, they're still calling for donations. And so we put that, uh, that screenshot there on your screen to have, for you to have a look at how you can help. Um, this is something that's put together by the Ghana Association of Doctors in Residency. They're asking you to help fight. That is the code, uh, num the, the uh, short code through which you can support is uh, star 88, star 887, uh, star 2 hash. That's how you can support. And if you do wish to do so, kindly help out. I've been talking to Sheikh Ibrahim Ibn Sana. He is a public health and infectious disease pharmacist, and he's head of pharmacy unit at Chest Diseases Kolebu Teaching Hospital. I'll end frontline with this message that's coming from someone who doesn't ask the name. It says, God bless all health workers who are risking their lives on behalf of the country and Ghanaians. Stay home to avoid the spreading of the virus. This has been Frontline. Continue the show. I'm taking you back to the UDS where we're speaking with Dr. Yagbon. He'll help us understand the impact from his perspective of the lockdown uh, uh, as well. Hello, Doc. Hopefully we haven't lost him. Hello, hello, Doc. Right, we've lost him, but we're trying to raise him back on the line. But most of you are still sending in your messages about COVID-19. You still have uh, questions. You still have concerns on your mind that you want um, uh, addressed. 
Well, this one says congratulations to all our health centers, especially to those in charge of the COVID-19 pandemic. All of us are in this together. Yours is to stay home. Let's go back on the line. I have Dr. Yagbon on the line. Doc, thank you very much for your patience. Help us to understand from your perspective the impact of the lockdown as far as the regional perspective is concerned. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, let me first commend the government for this partial lockdown, which was also a recommendation from the NDC COVID-19 uh, technical team that has been established by the uh, flag bearer of NDC. Uh, yes, the lockdown is one of the recommendations from even World Health to give countries assistance some time to be able to plan and then uh, attack the virus aggressively. Hmm. So for this, I thought it was a good idea. However, it was the way the lockdown happened that had posed a lot of um, challenges. Okay. Uh, an announcement was made, and I think people were given 24, 48 hours. 48 hours, yes. For the lockdown. The purpose of the lockdown seemed to be defeated because this lockdown was to actually have people stay home, stay at the locations where we seem to have the majority of the cases coming from so that we do not spread further. But when these 48 hours were given, people who were coming or living in those areas, and for this I'll be specific, the majority of them being the high and powerful uh, people, and these are the people who normally migrate mostly from the northern part of Ghana to those areas before greener pastures. They decided to get back home. And so the question is, what have we now done? So then, the other idea would have been, what are the preparations that we have put in place to have these people actually go through a system that will rule out the fact that they are infected, they are getting back into their communities, and these communities they are getting back are not affected at this point. It didn't seem to be something of that sort. So we have had several buses of, uh, uh, you know, shipping into the north, in the upper east, upper west, northern, the three northern regions with these people. In some places, let me commend the Bali District um, Assembly and the Health Directive for what they put in place to receive their returning. They were able to quarantine them Okay. And they have uh, put in place a system where families will bring food to feed these people. And they want to have them for the 14 days. I think that is one of the best things to have been done. Okay. But because as a, a nation, we didn't really have clear plans. So, 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 so Doc, do. let me just find out from you. Now, you've indicated the good thing about this, that for the Bali district that you've just mentioned, they were able to quarantine those that were seen coming in. Um, yeah. In the western region, Takradi to be specific, we understand that people who were going in were being screened, at least for the temperature, even though that is not foolproof at this point. What, what do you think we can do with the problem? that you've highlighted, that at the what? time we gave the space within which people were allowed to move before the lockdown, within that space, a lot of people have moved to different places. How do we deal with such a problem from your perspective? Yes, so in, in some parts of the northern um, region, they also did this temperature um, testing, which we all know that that is not enough to you know, reveal that somebody is infected. You could be having malaria, what have you, and you have temperature, but then, we also do know that there are people who are asymptomatic, and so mm -hmm. they may not have been having any high temperatures to be able to detect. But anyway, they are now home. I think what needs to be done is that we need to start to do the tracing, to work with the district assemblies and the district health directors in all the regions that, and the NATMOS and Red Tech and you know, direct in all the regions that these people have returned to. It is not too late to face these people and do testing. So that means that we really have to move on to doing the mass testing. Hmm. We also need to educate. We need to have public health officials in the community who would really educate community members around this, the exodus of the 
Kaye back to their community. What does that mean? What is it that community should expect? Once they have their uh, daughter or son back home who hasn't been uh, screened, there's a lot of anxiety in the community. And as mm -hmm. I speak right now, I am in the upper east region in one of the villages. And yeah. what I hear from people, there's a lot of anxiety. They have also heard that people have come home, and even the families that have them, that they are coming home from a place where this disease was, and that they are likely to be coming home with the virus to infect them. So there is that anxiety. But yeah. nothing is being done specifically in a coordinated way. That mm. will let communities really know exactly what they are supposed to do. To there be an issue of the case. So let, let, let's... Community. So, so, so uh, before you wrap up, Doc, let, let's take a look at the area where you are, the Upper West Region. We're told that the, there's only one recorded case as of now. That's in the Upper West Region. Now, experts have, say, have said that the best way for a lockdown to happen or the best time for a lockdown to happen is when it is not too late, so that it's when it hasn't spread already. Would you work, reckon, do you reckon that this is a time where there has to be, for example, a lockdown uh, so of sort to track this person that has one uh, brought this uh, disease to the area and at least try and separate him from all the others or will it be is it too early seeing that there's only one case in the region well you know uh, for us to be able to combat this it means that things will have to be done as um, you know as fast as we can yeah the Upper West case we are talking about was an imported case as well. This fellow mm -hmm. started from Italy to Egypt and all of that and got to the Upper West. And then all of a sudden, this person was infected. Mm. Similar to what I'm talking about, that these people have come back into their community because we are carrying the virus. And so if this is what we're expecting, and lockdown would solve the case. Lockdown would help us be able to face these people, track down, do the, the uh, mass uh, testing, and be sure. And you know, that has to take about the 14 days. It's not about when they were returning and the temperatures and all, whatever they did on the way that uh, suggests that these people are free or not. It would just have to be this system of quarantining them for the 14 days and be able to do that. And that cannot be done without looking at the consequences. We know that food security is an issue. And we also do know the economic impact when there's this lockdown. And so it was the reason why the country started with the context-based lockdown. It wasn't the whole country. It was, you know, partial. And that means moving on to where the need is. And so if the need now is that we need to do that, but then we have a plan in place that will reduce the burden on the people and we do the mass testing. And we are sure that those communities that these people have returned are you know, at a, 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 in a position to be able to say uh, we don't have cases, uh, transmission, chain of transmission is broken, and what have you, then that is something that I would recommend. You also do know that those that were not able to get back to their community and they were trapped in Kumasi, Manakura, and all of that, and then the government has been able to find them a place to stay. Commendable. But what we're advocating is not happening. We're advocating for social distancing. What you see on TV with those people in a crowded place, racking for food and all of that, there's nothing like social distancing. Right, Doc. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I'm sure that subsequently we'll be able to have more analysis um, from your perspective. Dr. Vaida Yapon is a senior lecturer, UDS Tamale. This is Told the Pulse with me, Gifty, and up here.
government has today vowed that the sanctions fixed in the imposition of restrictions law to contain COVID-19 will be enforced to the letter. Information Minister Kojo Ponkrumah said the security agencies have been directed to deal with any person found breaching those directives. This comes in the wake of concerns and allegations that some officers have beaten up citizens who have disobeyed the directives, even though sometimes some of them are expected to be on the list of exemptions. Ms. Oponkruma and Head of Police Prosecutions for Greater Accra, ACP Donko, have been speaking on the matter at a news conference. Now, the Constitution of the Republic gives all of us a number of liberties. But because of the current situation in which we are, we have had to take measures. Excellency, the President has had to take measures in the interest of the country to suspend some of our liberties and to impose restrictions. These suspensions and impositions have to be done in accordance with law. And so you will recall that right from his earlier broadcast, he mentioned that he was instructing some ministers uh, to get either some legislations passed or some executive instruments issued and gazetted. We just want to give an update for the avoidance of doubt this morning. The declaration of public health emergency for COVID-19 pandemic, executive instrument 61, is currently in force. It was gazetted on the 23rd of March under the signature of the Minister for Health, the Honorable Kweku Ajima Menu, Member of Parliament. And it is pursuant to subsection 1 of section 169 of Act 851. So the Public Health Act, Act 851, which gives them the power to declare public health emergency. And based on that declaration, also now quarantine persons, which would ordinarily be against that person's liberties. It's in force. And so we want to encourage uh, for our colleagues, uh, if it becomes necessary that you are asked to either self-isolate or to be put in a quarantine facility, there are laws that back it shortly. I'll show you some of the sanctions if uh, we also do not comply. At this point in time, we're asking everybody to comply with authorities. But this is for the avoidance of doubt. EI-61 is now in force. It is what gives us the power to quarantine persons uh, who have tested positive and also to restrict their liberties while we are um, supporting them with treatment. The President also asked for the enactment of an act known as the Imposition of Restrictions Act. As I'm sure you have followed, Parliament has uh, enacted that. The President has gazetted that as well. It is that act that gives a broad framework for the imposition of further restrictions on the broader Ghanaian population. To do that, the president has had to issue two different executive instruments. EI-64, which was gazetted also on the 23rd of March, 2020, under the signature of His Excellency the President, Nana Adodankwa Kufuado, and EI-65, which is the latest that uh, imposes the restrictions on Greater Accra and Greater Kumase, um, gazetted on the 30th of March, under the signature of uh, the President of the Republic, Nana Rodanko Akufuado. Uh, these two are available. We'll give you copies, colleagues, so that you can also, as part of education, make it available to um, the general public. As the Minister for Information earlier today, without breakdown, well, let's take a look at the current uh, case count for Ghana. As of now, we, did, we have about 200 cases confirmed across the country. And a total of about 49 patients with COVID-19 have been discharged for home care. As mentioned in the last conference, we have already added two more facilities in Greater Accra to provide care because a large number of cases are in Accra. So I'll give you a breakdown of where that is in the Bank of Ghana and the University of Ghana uh, med uh, med uh, medical center. Let me give you a breakdown of what's happening in Ga East, which is the, the largest center currently now. Currently, we have 58 people on admission. Yesterday, we admitted two new people. There are three of them who are getting oxygen, and we are believe we are informed that they are getting better. A total of 38 has been discharged for home care and we are following them on a daily basis with home visits, and they are actively getting better. 
Ridge Hospital has four cases. They are all there been there between they've had a case since uh, for ter between 13 and 19 days. Um, we are waiting to the 21st day. I mean, last you are reached 21 days, and then you are retested, and if you are negative, then you can you are discharged. At the 37 military hospital, uh, one case is on admission, and they are also managing six cases at home. Uh, they have an excellent facility with uh, 20 bed uh, treatment center with four ICUs available on bed ventilators for people who need care. The home case, um, 20 of the 20 cleaning are waiting repeat. Of those who are home, the home care, the 49 I mentioned, um, about 20 are waiting, retesting, and if they are negative, then they will be discharged. And now, as we said the last time, two people have already tested negative and they have been discharged. Uh, that has declared cure. Kumasis has no case, and uh, the only one case they have qualified for home care, so it's been managed from home. Konfanochi has, um, has a case, one case on admission, and repeat test was negative, uh, and then positive, and then we have also put him on treatment to see how it goes. Obuasi has two cases and they are all being managed uh, at home. So far, 12 contacts of the second case have been followed. The first one had about 30 contacts which have been followed. And while we have uh, one case on home care, Tamale has 10 cases. They are stable on treatment. So seven of them are still managed from the hotel where they are, and two are in the hospitals. Eastern region has one case reported and awaiting more information. Either they'll be managed at home or be transferred to the hospital. But currently, they are being managed at Atua Hospital uh, for further management. UGMC, as we said, is complete with five ICUs and 14 beds, and they are ready for use. In terms of case management, there have been a lot of capacity building. They have a bus at their disposal for their home care, etc. We have given them three pickups so that doctors can people, people, visit people at home and provide the necessary care. Currently, uh, today, people will be trained on how to use the ventilators in the, in the ambulances to manage care should they need be, and that is going to take place this morning. Well, from day one, one of the, one of the major concerns has been the use uh, or the availability of PPEs. And on front line here on um, the polls, we've had several conversations about this. Well, the issue came up strongly at today's press conference. Listen. PPEs remain a major challenge for all of us. And I think it's not just Ghana, but it's a global challenge. Um, we continue to provide as many as can be put and put in there. This and then more continues coming in. We have received a significant number of coveralls that is being distributed today and some masks uh, last night, which is being distributed. But these are definitely not going to be enough. And so we urge facility heads to have ensure appropriate distribution of the masks. Generally, majority of our people will yet need masks nose mask and gloves. And that's what we're going for more than 95, 98% of all health workers. We want to ensure that that's available. We've started the process of um, having some local production of one, and what I'm wearing is a local production that um, is comfortable, it can be washed and real. And I think this is something we want to promote. We want to ensure, encourage all people to wear masks, if you can, especially those who have blue light symptoms to wear masks, but the person has problems who should wear their own masks to ensure that these things are done. So a lot more is being done to push more PPEs into the system. And there are plans to provide local uh, production to boost uh, what we are bringing in currently. Ladies and gentlemen, the contact tracing, I think today is the fifth or so day since we started. Um, we are testing all contacts in Accra, in Kumasi, and across the country, and do their contacts and for them. We are testing all people we meet in their homes. We have hotspots where we visit, like Tamale, contact tracing is being done. Our contact tracing is being done. Currently, 
you are looking at about 110 contacts in the eastern region who are being tested, and then the report will be shared as and when they come in. Up as yesterday, over 6,000 tests, samples have been taken for testing. So testing currently ongoing across the country. That's as at 6 p.m. yesterday. We also are looking at the, the quarantine uh, patients who were negative and still in the hotels. We so far tested, completed seven hotels. We've done tests for 538 of them. And then once the results are ready, we are hoping that within the, within the next day, today, and probably by the end of tomorrow, all the tests will have been done and the results will be shared with all, uh, all people in the hotel and the preparation for discharge will be done based on, or management will be done based on the results to, that we have. We will continue to follow up contacts, uh, and we plead to all Ghanaians to support. So far, the reports on the field show that a lot of encouragement, and that um, once they do the house, they are encouraged to look at the area where the positive is to test people to see whether is there any community spread, to give us a gauge as to what is really happen and we get and, and, and treat all to support and encourage them. People were asking for identification. This is the directors have given them some notification to show that they are really people who are there sent by the service to offer uh, doses. Those who are positive, we are continuing to provide them psychosocial support across the country. Psychologists have been engaged to talk to all those who are positive and negative to uh, and brief them on the next steps of what to do and uh, we also uh, entreat all to abide by the quarantine rules that have been shared with them to save themselves, their loved ones, and all of us. So what's the latest on contact tracing? That is also an issue that was addressed at the press conference today. From the beginning, we have mentioned that we're doing contact of all those who are contacts who come to their homes. And we will do the periphery around the area where you are, but it's not compulsory. It's voluntary. Where they could do tests to test for um, other possible community transmission. When you have a community that may have a lot of positives, that tends to be quite intensive and see a lot of uh, tracing going around your community. But we've not had similar co problems in other places. And so it depends on how it is. And as we continue testing, as new tests become positive, their contacts will be traced. And so the intensity will depend on how many positives are in the area. But as we said, it is voluntary, but it's in our own interest to ensure that we get tested. There are people who are asking to be tested. And if they fall within the private, I will test them. The Psychological Association were also there. They've been speaking. You know, when we talk of mental health, many of us may have different understanding about what it is. But mental health is basically about any life event that rocks our world. It can affect the way we think, the way we feel, how we behave, usually in a negative sense. And COVID-19 is such a life event we are talking about. And that presupposes that we are all potential mental health patients. In a sense, COVID-19, we don't need to introduce it. It has become so devastating that children cannot hug their grandpas, their grandmothers, and they cannot be cuddled in return. Almost every facet of our society has been affected by the spread of COVID-19. And this novel coronavirus, by its nature, spreading patterns and manner of behavior that continue to dribble the scientific world, introduces a more psychological virus. Fear, panic, anxiety, helplessness, some signs of depression. And I think all of us may have found ourselves with these descriptions that I've given. Think about these words related to COVID-19. You hear of virus, either in the health sector or in the IT world. Virus means you are likely to lose something. 
think of isolation. To be isolated is not something pleasant. It's not comforting. Think of quarantine or quarantine. It is not something comforting. And lastly, look at the current one. All of us and many countries are enjoying lock down. To lock and down is not positive. And that is why the inclusion of psychologists with Ghana Health Service, the Ministry of Health, and other stakeholders became very relevant. And even ultimately, the Ministry of Information became very relevant. Just to help you appreciate why our services were more important, think about these. Look at the effect of confinement and social distancing. We are Ghanaians. We are Africans. We have our ways of behaving. The social psychologists would be interested in looking at how one person interacts with the other. And now there is a barrier, social distancing or physical distancing. So we can't do things the way we used to. And that becomes a challenge we need to adjust to. And as we socially distance ourselves, boredom may set in. The relationship between us and our friends, our family members, our work colleagues, all these may be affected in one way or the other. How we even deal with children, older ones, the developmental psychologists will be interested, and that is what they have been doing, to look at how we can help people at different stages in their lives in fighting COVID-19. And especially vulnerable groups, some may already be having bipolar or existing mental health situations. How do we assess these ones? Think about the workplace. Indeed, the industrial and organizational psychologists or business psychologists, they have been working with organizations to cope with this changing trend as a result of COVID-19. We cannot operate the way we used to. Many people may have to work from home. What HR strategy do we have? How are we managing the people while they are home? As employees, how are we managing ourselves while we are at home and still ensuring steady business continuity among others. These are all important parts. Think of the likely potential job loss. How are we going to discuss this? Engaging employees and all that. The business psychologists or industrial and organizational psychologists, we are working with organizations to ensure this is done. Think of the public behavior. The panic buying, look at the offending and exploitation that is going on. Why should we expect people to behave this way? especially in times of crisis. The community psychologists will be interested in looking at how, indeed, we can promote community-based inter inter interventions, how we can help one another to ensure that all of us take and those are uh, excerpts from the press conference held earlier, held earlier today by government and state authorities on health. Now, a victim of alleged military brutality related to the lockdown in Kumasi has ignored all advice to reporters or due to the police following the incident of the Ija market. Despite visible marks of assault, commercial driver Smaila Musa says the money he would use to travel to the police station would be better spent on food and medical treatment. Musa rushed to the multimedia group's offices in Kumasi to recount his ordeal after the task force and forcing the lockdown, according to him, sorted him. He spoke to Nanaya Jima, who has filed this report. A trembling smiler arrived at the station on a motorbike, bare-chested, with marks of assault, and he says the pain was so unbearable that he couldn't put his singlet and his shirt on. With the shirt in his hand and the underwear around his neck, he holds out a poly bag containing what he claims to have purchased at the market to prepare his supper. In a sad tone, Smiler struggles to narrate what happened. <laughs> I had packed a few goods I had bought in the trunk of my bike. When they saw me, they came to me and asked my reason for coming out. I responded, I came here for foodstuffs. One started beating me with rope and impressed on me to leave. My battery is faulty, so it takes time to respond when you start. 
Since I couldn't start it immediately, they all came at me and started beating me. Some used the butt of their guns to hit me. When Smiler was reminded of police call for such incidents to be reported for investigations, he ignored because, according to him, many of such occurrences go unpunished. We hear the military are beating people unprovoked. I didn't believe it until now. I'm now a victim and I want the world to see. I don't want to go to the police because they will not take any action. So some residents at Aija here, you see in your short gather, having a conversation. According to them, their rooms are too hot and therefore they cannot be in there forever. Obviously, they defy government order to stay within their homes. According to them, the victim had his motorbike parked right here and had joined them for the conversation. They kept shouting at him to move his motorbike, but he would not do that immediately. Even one market woman pleaded with him to do so, but he kept looking at them in the face. Another one came over to hit him with a cane. Then another joined, bringing the number to three. They beat him several times before he jumped onto the motorbike to leave. Checks at the Ija market review, Smiler failed to immediately heed to the order to move his motorbike. Hence, the alleged punishment meted to him by the military men. Whether the delay in leaving the scene warrants for that kind of punishment is another story to delve into. From Kumase for Joy News, Nana Ojima reporting. Now, medical equip equipment worth over 120,000 Ghana cities meant to prevent the spread of the deadly coronavirus in the Upper West Region has been donated to the regional hospital and five health centers in the Dafiama Busie Isa district. Kolendi at Law and Scamport Limited came to the rescue of the Upper West Region after the Dafiama Busie Isa. Uh, district sent an SOS message to benevolent organizations and individuals to come to their aid to help fight the disease. Upper West Regional Minister Dr. Hafiz Bin Sali, who received the items for onward distribution to the beneficiary health facilities, called on other well meaning people in society to follow the example of Colendi at Law and Scamfort Limited. Upper West correspondent Rafiq Salam reports. The items valued at a little over 120,000 Ghana cities is the biggest single donation to the region ever since a case of the coronavirus was recorded in the region last Friday. The items donated include face masks comprising of 155 N99 respirators and 3,400 surgical masks, 18,000 nitrate gloves, 4,000 disposable aprons, 50 washable personal protective equipment, 4,000 sleeve covers, 8,000 hair covers, 4,000 shoe covers, 72 Papa Jumbo paper towels, and 4,250 toilet rolls, 18 infrared gun thermometers, 6 buckets of 4.5 kg of fluorine were also part of the list of items donated. Kulendi at Law and Scamport Limited donated the items for equal distribution to the Upper West Regional Hospital and all five health centers in the Dafima Bure Isa district. According to the Executive Director of Kulendi at Law, Yoni Kulendi, the items are meant for health service workers who continue to put themselves at risk in service to the people in spite of the increased risks of COVID-19 pandemic. Upper West Regional Minister Dr. Hafiz Bin Sali received the items 
for onward distribution to the beneficiary facilities. On behalf of the chiefs and people of the Upper West Region, I thank this great son of the land for coming to the aid of his people at the time that they need it most. The entire Upper West Region is behind this son of ours. We wish to use this opportunity to appeal to all and sundry to emulate this shining example as demonstrated by lawyer Yoni Kulendi. The Fiema Bure Isa District Chief Executive Nadi Moro Sanda on his part sounded philosophical whilst assuring their benefactors that the items received will be put into good use. Fighting this coronavirus anywhere in the world is fighting the virus everywhere in the world. This is because we all know uh, from what we are hearing that this virus emanated from somewhere. But within a trickle of an eye, it is spreading to everywhere in the world. And for that matter, fighting the virus in Upper West or DBI is as good as fighting this virus everywhere. So we say that we have received these items with all our heart, we're going to hand it over to our health directorate and make sure we supervise him so that the places that the items are supposed to go and do service to our people is really done. The Dafima Bure Isa district has 17 chips compounds and five health centers. They can only boast of only two non contact thermometers. Three of the non contact thermometers have been given to them who the district director of health services, Emmanuel Samwok said, will be of great help to the people. And they were using the normal thermometers. And of course, because of the outbreak, we now need to take the temperatures of clients without touching them. And this has called for the use of the gun thermometers. And so it is greatly coming to help. We are going to ensure that the gun thermometers are used at even at the entry point of the health center. So that once we pick you, a client coming to the facility with high temperature, you are already isolated from the rest of the OPD clients so that you, if you hope, happen to be a case, you don't even transmit to the rest of the OPD clients in the first place. Important for the news, Rafik Salam. Wa. And before I go, let me just remind you of a passionate appeal being made by doctors for you to support the activities, support their work with PPEs. You can donate to any health uh, facility at all around you. My name is Gifty Andop here. If you do log on to myjoyonline.com, there's more news. And you can take your time and go through them. If you scroll all the way down on that page, our YouTube link has our uh, programs from here on the Joiners channel. Remember to also alert your friends that we can be found now on your digital TV. You don't need a box to find us again. We're free to air. Have a good evening and enjoy the rest of our programs.